So our uh, second speaker is Ami Taiwan Kony. <coughs> um, he will talk about uh, almost QBDs in the prepare and measure scenario. Um, so please. Thank you. So this talk, it will be about uh, simple objects that most of you know very well, d-dimensional quantum systems which I call qubits here, but we will try to perturb them a little bit and construct a new object, which I call almost qubit systems. So systems that are pretty much a qubit, but not real. To get there, I want to talk to you first a bit about the prepare and measure scenario. This is a situation where you have a sender, which I call Alice, and a receiver that I call Bob. Alice can take some classical data, encode it in some quantum state, and send it over some channel. Bob can then select some measurement based on some classical data Y, perform that on the state he received over the channel, and get some outcome B. Repeat this many times, and you will get statistics. The probability of getting outcome B, given that Alice sent symbol number X and Bob measured measurement number Y. Typically here, if you want to do interesting physics, you have to assume something about what's going on in the devices. Typically, we say that Bob can perform any measurement he wants, Alice can create any state she wants, but the thing that goes over the channel has to have some form of physical limitation. There are many ways of limiting this, but the typical and most, most well-studied way is to limit the dimension of this quantum channel to be a d-dimensional channel. It supports one qubit. This type of system, where you have a dimensional limitation but otherwise completely uncharacterized systems, have been used for quite a lot of things, generally under the umbrella of semi-device independent quantum information. Some examples are put here. For example, here, when you have no knowledge of Alice's and Bob's devices, you can use it for semi-device independent quantum key distribution. This was done in uh, Pioneer in some works here. You can use it for quantum random numbers. You can use it for self-testing, that is to characterize what is going on in the black boxes of Alice and Bob. You can use it for basic quantum information protocols, like random access codes. And you can also use this type of black box approaches to infer the dimension of an otherwise unknown system simply by looking at the correlations they are able to create in the lab. It tells you something about how much knowledge they must support. But again, you can imagine prepare and measure scenarios in a much more different physical frameworks than limiting the physical dimension. And in fact, people have been doing this in recent years quite extensively. So there are quite a few of alternative assumptions that are, physically speaking, very different from limiting a dimension. Some of those examples from recent years is to limit the energy of the system. So you can prepare any state that goes over this channel, but that channel only supports a certain amount of energy. So you can, from a more operational point of view, simply put a power meter at the end of your channel see how much energy you have, and then deduce all your physics only from this very simple and measurable assumption. Another way, which is more information theoretical, is to limit the accessible information. So you create a suitable, uh, operationally relevant entropy quantity and say that the channel supports that much entropy being sent. Other ways are to say that you have, you have a sender that is trying to create a certain state, but this state cannot be perfectly created simply because you don't have flawless control of your lab. So you can limit the fidelity with your ability to create that state in the lab and operate only under assumptions like this. Other assumptions are limits on the overlaps of the states you can create in your lab and also operating from non-contextuality. So assuming that whatever this channel is, it is non-contextual, and then by having contextuality in quantum mechanics, you can see interesting physical effects. So all this to say that there are, many, there are many other ways of approaching these communication settings than using dimensions, because there is quite some reason to want to leave the dimension framework. And this is also par partly the motivation for why all these alternative frameworks were introduced in recent years. There are some notable drawbacks to a dimension-based approach to prepare and measure communications. The first one is that the dimension is not an observable. If I give you a setup, there is no measurement you can perform so that you learn the dimension of Hilbert space. It is an abstract quantity. It's not something you can read out of a measurement. The second problem is that most real physical systems are not qubits or qtrits or limited to any finite energy level. 
So, but then very, very well we can use these infinite dimensional systems to accurately approximate a qubit and then we simply call it a qubit because it's handy. So then this leads us to our, to our question. Firstly, how detrimental are these tiny dimensional deviations that the real physical systems will give you in what we then call qubit communication protocols? When you base a protocol on a certain dimension, how much do you have to pay for the fact that in reality you don't really have a qubit? Another question related to this is, can these dimension-based protocols be made more operational? Can I formulate the assumption of sending a qubit over the channel in such a way that it captures the fact that actually there is not really a qubit going over the channel? At this point, we attempt to answer this in a very operational way, so without specifying the specific physical system that we are dealing with. Instead, we want to say if you can abstractly, from very small amount of probing your system, say something about how well it approximates a qubit. We call it an almost d-dimensional system. So the definition is straightforward. We say the state here is an almost qubit if this relation here is satisfied. What this relation means is that the state can be literally anything. It can live in an any countably infinite dimensional Hilbert space. Here, you have a rank D projector, and you don't know what this projects on. It, you have this huge Hilbert space in which your state lives on, and then there is a D-dimensional subspace somewhere where your qubit is living. Now, what you want is that your set of states, whatever they are, are confined to this D-dimensional subspace, the qubit, almost completely, up to a deviation of epsilon. If epsilon is zero, you're back to a normal qubit. If you have a small perturbation, you have an almost qubit system. There is an alternative way to think about this definition, and that is in terms of a norm. So here you take a state, and then you take its projection onto this arbitrary d-dimensional subspace, and you say that its norm is smaller than epsilon. You can think of it more operationally simply by saying that your ability to discriminate between the state and its qubit projection is essentially very small. So what we want to do is to look at systems like this, where we again have Alice and Bob, but now they're connected by an almost d-dimensional channel. A little example of how you can see the relevance of this type of definition in action uh, is here in an optical coherent state, so the thing that typically comes out of a laser. What you can do is to say, well, if I want to create a qubit, as is done in many experiments, I tune the photon number really low, and I know that I pretty much have a qubit. How much is that? Well, you can calculate the deviation for a qubit, and you can see that it's this. If you take your photon number to be small, which is the absolute value of alpha here, you will find that this quantity is pretty much alpha. So this is why, why a qubit can be approximated by a weak coherent state. Tuning your uh, photon number low it becomes more and more faithful representation of a two-dimensional space, but not exactly. You have to take the photon number as your deviation to accurately have this representation. So, first question is, well, do these small perturbations actually matter? Do I have to bother with them? Do they have any, any consequences that are worth noting? So this is the first example of why small perturbations can have big impact. And this example comes from quantum random number generation. Here we have uh, the, some results, which is a compilation of various works. Uh, here on this axis, you see the randomness expressed in terms of the min entropy uh, of uh, Bob when he reads out his numbers. Here you have a security parameter, which we don't really need to detail. It's called the random access code. The larger the security parameter is, the harder it is to give a classical simulation, the more randomness you can have. The black curve that you see here is the standard qubit representation. So you forget about your almost two-dimensional systems, and you find that, well, it quickly decays, and eventually the randomness goes away. Now, as soon as you have a tiny deviation, so here is uh, one-tenth of a percent. So these are fidelities that are 99.9% .9 accurate. As soon as you do this, a large share of your randomness can, goes away. Already at 1% deviation from your actual qubit model, almost all of your randomness is gone for a nearly flawless experiment. It means that if you are operating an experiment where you think you have a qubit, and I am able to harvest the, the physical inaccuracy of your qubit system, I can make you believe that you have randomness that you do not actually have, 
with very small deviations being present. Another example for a different task is the, the task of certifying that a measurement does what it's supposed to do. So here we want to certify a qubit measurement which has four outcomes. So it's an extremal POVM measurement. Similar story, here on this axis you have uh, a correlation witness suitably designed to, to witness the measurement that we happen to be interested in. In this case, it's a sick POVM. So here on this axis, you have the deviation. So if you go to zero, you have the usual qubit system again. Here you have the limits that you can get on this witness if you have a genuine three outcome and a genuine four outcome measurement. Since you work with qubits, genuine four outcome just means the generic qubit system. You cannot have more outcomes without being classically similable with projective measurements. So what happens is that this black curve tells you how quickly you start deviating from the actual qubit model. Here are some points to notice. An experiment was actually done trying to certify a genuine four outcome POVM on a qubit that cannot be simulated with projective measurements. It achieved the limitation of three outcome physics, so you got a point here, but it turns out that you can simulate it using only the measurements you're trying to falsify if you have a deviation which is roughly 0 0.005, sorry, I forgot the zero, 0.005%. So five parts in 1,000, all you need to falsify this type of experimental data. Another point to note is this one. The amount of deviation you need in an ordinary qubit, in order to be able to even go beyond any correlations a qubit could ever produce using much simpler measurements than a four outcome one, that is achieved already in three parts in 1,000. So small deviations can certainly have a substantial impact, at least in these protocols. So given that, we, we set out to see, well, how can we handle these errors and how can we rigorously account for them so that one can construct perturbations to dimension-based protocols that are safe to, against uh, the physical shortcomings of their realizations. What we want to do is to characterize the set of correlations that you can get from a d-dimensional system with a given amount of uh, a given amount of perturbation to your dimension limit. Here is the set of correlations that we want to create. So again, it's the probabilities of getting outcome B for Bob when the message is X and the measurement is Y. We do this by using the method of semi-definite relaxations, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. The gist of the idea is that you try to give a relaxation of the actual set of correlations that you want to characterize by using a hierarchy of STPs. So by running a first level, you can get an outer relaxation. By running a more complicated second level, you can get a better outer relaxation, and so on. In fact, we are able to construct a hierarchy uh, that can many times be used to address these problems. Uh, just give the, the gist of how this, how this hierarchy works. So the idea is that you introduce a list of operators that appear in your physical problem. So of course you have the identity, you have all the states you're creating, you have all the measurements that Bob is implementing, but on top of that you also give this artificial operator that doesn't physically exist in your problem. I call it V. V is gonna get some suitable properties. It's a projector and its trace is D. So if it's a projector with trace D, it is emulating that D-dimensional projector somewhere in the otherwise unlimited Hilbert space in which all your D-dimensional action is happening. From this operator list, you can construct a monomial list, so a set of products taken from the operator list. And from that, you can construct a moment matrix. So you take some monomials over the operator list, and then you take all these moments and arrange them in this matrix that I call gamma. I can write out gamma, looks like this in the simplest case, first level, so monomials of length one. Here you have, uh, here you have again the whole list S, and you can see some of the elements that play a role in our construction. For example, when you have U and V here being equal to, for example, this artificial operator V, then when it meets the identity, it traces to D and carries one of these constraints that we are imposing for this problem. Similarly, when V meets V in this moment matrix and the trace is taken, you again get D because we have constructed it in this way, again, emulating the QD subspace. In this way, you also get all the probabilities that you want to construct. Where the measurements are sandwiched with the states, you of course get the Born rule, and you get all the probabilities back. And then on top of this, you need the almost QDIT structure. 
And that you get in this box here, where the states are meeting this operator B. You get the product B times rho X and the traces of beside, and therefore you can impose the condition that they are only epsilon away from being that QDIT that you want them to be. Using this, you can give sufficient conditions in order to create your quantum correlations with <laughs> arbitrary perturbations. So the question is if this method is actually useful in practice uh, or not. And it turns out it's quite useful. It can address the problems that I, I showed you before. For example, these are exactly the same plots you saw before for quantum random number generation and for certifying a genuine four outcome qubit measurement. So the curves that I saw here, showed you here, these were hacking strategies, how you could use the epsilons pertur perturbing your dimension to fake that you have key or pretend that you have a measurement that you actually don't have. These curves are optimal, in fact. The hacking strategies can be matched, proving that there is no better way to hack them using this method of semi-definite relaxation. So then one can, in fact, take these errors into account when performing uh, these various protocols. One can also go a bit further and address a quite well-known task known as a quantum random access code. This is the simplest variant of this task. In this task, you have two bits on Alice, x0 and x1, and you have two questions on Bob, 0 and 1. The questions are saying, which is the value of Alice's uh, bit, number y? So if y is equal to 0, you want to learn x0. If y is equal to 1, you want to learn x1. And if you answer that question correctly, you get a point. So in the end, you're randomly accessing the database of Alice. This task is very well known for qubit systems. It was solved over 20 years ago. The best way you can perform this is, to, is with a success rate that is roughly this much. This is around 85% success. This is better than anything you can do with a classical system. But then the question is, if you try to implement a task like this, how well does it, how much does it improve? How much perturbation do you induce if your qubit system is actually only almost a qubit system? Using this SDP relaxation method, you can give a very simple perturbation term to this. That is, you keep the old limit for, with an exact qubit, and on top of that, you pick up a linear correction uh, with a one over square root of two correction factor to it when you are in the small epsilon regime, which is where you typically will be because you have small perturbations to your dimensions. Another limit where one can apply this method is to standard d-dimensional systems, so no epsilons anymore, but it gives you a very simple way of getting bounds on finite dimensional quantum correlations uh, from our SDP method. So one of the main advantages of the method is that it doesn't scale in complexity as you increase the actual dimension of the system. The dimension it enters as a linear constraint, but nothing more. So for example, one can put all the epsilons to zero, go to a normal dimension-based picture, and ask, well, how well can I characterize high dimensional correlations in a normal setting? To exemplify it, here is a slightly more complicated random access code. This time, Alice has three trips, and Bob has three questions asking for the value of each and every one of them. If he gets it right, you get a point. This random access code is in fact not known. It's not known what's the best quantum performance of it. But with our method, using an exact QDIT system here, we can easily get simple bounds on how good this can be, and those bounds close very quickly. Here you have that success rate of how well Bob can guess the, guess the answer correctly. Here you have the dimension of the channel, going from two all the way up to 20. Again, the complexity of the computations remain constant because of our method, and therefore, dimension 20 is just as cheap as dimension two. And one can quickly see that the narrowing of the bound is rather rapid. With a simple computation, you can get an almost exact resolution. So in conclusion, the point, the take home message from this is that the small dimensional deviations can quite significantly compromise semi-device independent quantum information protocols, no matter if it's in certification of measurements, randomness, QKD, or probably many other expectations as well. To, an attempt to resolve this is our, is our definition of the almost QDIT system which is an operational way of addressing these shortcomings. And a natural open problem for this is then how one can construct efficient semi-device independent protocols for things like QKD and QRNG that are robust to these types of perturbations. So with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ami. So, um, 
there is uh, enough time for questions. Um, okay, so let me ask Wang. Uh, you mentioned that a small um, dimensional deviation can have a bigger uh, impact on the, on the result, right? So do you have any uh, intuitive explanation for this? For, for why the, the deviations have a big impact? Yes. Yeah, so it really comes down to the black box setting. Let's see if I can, so this one here. If you would have a protocol where you have characterized devices, like BB84, where you know what is coming out of one of the devices, then these epsilons, the dimension perturbations, which are of course violating the assumption that you know what is coming out of your device, they will act as noise rather than as, as a parameter that can be used to conspire against the device. But if you're operating in a black box picture where the devices could do anything compatible with the data coming out of them, then these small deviations, these epsilons, can be used by an eavesdropper to conspire against you. And if you use it as, con as an ability to conspire rather than as noise that is averaged out over the system, that is what allows you to, to create these big impacts. So it's really the ability to have control of these errors for an eavesdropper that makes it possible to, to hack this protocol. Ah, okay, thank you. So for, I, I, see, I think I understand, yeah, it's, it's nice, yeah. <coughs> uh, thank you, Rami, for the nice talk. Uh, you mentioned that the computational cost, or, or the cost for D equals 20, is as equal to D equal to, so it's as cheap as D equal to. This is counterintuitive. Why, uh, can, you, can you tell me more about this complexity and why it's the same? I don't yeah. understand, thank you. Yeah, so, so in typical methods, if you have a larger dimension, you have to have more variables to represent the larger space and hence you have more complexity. But here, when we construct it, if I go back to this slide here, you see that the dimension is actually entering as a specific number in this matrix. So the dimension is, is the, the trace of this auxiliary operator that we made up, the dimension, the d-dimensional space where everything is supposed to happen. Now, if we want to tune up the dimension, we can simply change the numbers we have here and the epsilons, which we set to zero. So they enter as linear constraints on the matrix instead of expansions of the matrix. And hence, the number of variables and the size remains constant. Okay. Thank you. Well, it was pretty close. Uh, I was, yeah, um, thanks for the talk. It was really interesting. Um, I was wondering if you have a recipe for an experimentalist to find what this epsilon is. So it, it depends on the physical system. It, it, it really does. So for example, the optical coherent state there one has the recipe. You estimate the photon number and you can know your epsilon. If you have, say, uh, an SPDC source, a reasonable way to do it could be to estimate the higher order down conversion events when you get multi-photon events, for example. So this is really something that is setup dependent. So there is no generic recipe, I believe, for doing that. Okay, so, so there is like no, no um, like universal operational meaning so, because it sounds like it, it should be. Yeah, so the operational meaning is, is always there. It's, uh, it's this one here, that if you, would have, if you have the actual lab state, which is potentially infinite dimensional, and then if you were to project it onto the QDIT space where you want it to live, then your ability to discriminate these two by any quantum measurement would be very small. It would be epsilon. That is its information theoretical meaning. But of course, you need to be able to know roughly what that is, and to do that, you need to know what to measure in your lab. And this will have to depend on what's your actual setup. So it varies really from case to case there. Okay, thanks. Hello. 
thanks for the nice talk so my question is uh, can you use this almost curate thing rather than like prepare and measure scenarios the other scenarios like bell scenarios there there exists some prior work i believe um, now now i forgot uh, now i forgot uh, the reference but there exists prior work that uses this type of concept for bell scenarios and I think methods in this spirit based on STP relaxation also exist for there. So roughly yes, but I'm, fr I'm afraid I don't remember the details. Thanks. Okay, so let's thank the speaker again.